Hello everyone, we are live yet again. This is going to be one of my author's chats of the week. And I'll keep my eye out for my co-host. I know he's, if he's not already live, he'll be getting ready to get my invite soon. There he is. Perfect. Let me just send him the invite right now. And we'll be talking about books, writing, and polishing, and everything in between. So as this app populates, excuse me, I'm about to try not to sneeze. Um, we will get things going in just a moment. But uh, let's see if he sees my... Hello, hello. Hello. I hear you, but I do not see you at this moment. Time to turn up my volume. Yeah, I think I did. Took off the uh, video for some reason. Uh, let me correct that. Okay, it happens. Like I feel like almost what ninety percent of the time, <laughs> it just like automatically switches over to your icon. See, we're getting going. We'll be getting started in just a moment. Hopefully. I'm talking about all things books. Still don't see you at the moment. Whoop. Lost. We'll get him back. Hopefully. I don't know why I don't see invite now. Do 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 do. Let's see if I can get him back on here so we can get going. Hopefully. Huh. Logged off. Anywho, while he hopefully gets back on and we can get this thing going. But uh but yeah, oh, there he is. Yeah, we'll be it's been a it's gonna be a big week for me. I have to remind myself it's only Monday. And uh, I have a book release tomorrow, so I may be back live, jumping on. I didn't really plan to do it, but usually that's the case for the days I release a book. So we'll hope it should be a, a good day tomorrow. That's what I'm channeling, good good day vibes. Book release vibes or good day vibes? Hi! Hey, I just heard that. Pre-congrats, I guess. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> it just so happened it worked out that way, but, but thank you, thank you. Uh, it's been a moment since we've seen each other. I mean, I see you. It feels like our annual meet and greet is at Dragon Con, and I know we're both going to be on the book talk panel. <laughs> That's awesome. No, I'm excited for that. Um, yeah, like uh, I'm assuming you go to a bunch of other cons in the South. It's so weird that I've never seen you at another one but Dragon Con. <laughs> um, because probably that's the only one I've gone to. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. Well, no, that's fair. <laughs> I actually have one coming up in two weeks uh, called Con Carolinas Ooh. in Charlotte. It's it's a lot of fun. Um, I think that that's maybe the tier below Dragon Con. You've kind of got right. Dragon Con on like it's a lot tier level. And then you've got like another tier where it's like, these are really great for writers. And then you've got some that are just kind of more local. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm excited for Con Carolinas. I like that. Yeah, I'm trying to do better. Uh, I, I was, I'm always that baby step person. And so a few years ago, when I, when we were on the first panel together, that was the first time I ever went to a con in my life. So that, <laughs> so that was a lot. And then, you know, it took me a moment to like, okay, I can do this. And then this year I applied to another one. So I'm going to do two this fall and attend, um, attend one, uh, the author nation conference. So my full lineup, but I'm, I'm trying to be better about going to more of them. I know I've been trying to also note what's available because some of you guys already paid attention, probably have all these charts of where, where to go and when to apply. And I'm like, I'm behind the times. <laughs> I'm still getting used to the when to apply part. I'm, I'm really good at going as like a get as a, like just a person going, but mm -hmm. the guest part has taken me some getting used to, uh, I've kind of started to get used to the ones that my publisher Falstaff books the ones that they attend just because I get all of the alerts early. So it's like, I know when to, but yeah, it, I agree. It's tough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you do have to, you do have to like pay attention to uh, that. Cause uh, there was one that happened uh, Jordan con. It's another one that happens in the Georgia Atlanta area. 
and I guess it's a, it's been going on pretty for I don't know if it's twenty years, a number of years. It's, yeah, it's but it, it's not a huge one. It's like what you were saying, that kind of mid tier where it just pulls, yeah. I guess, that sweet spot of people who are bookish and you know fantasy nerds and the author side of things. So that's something that I may do again. But I've yet to travel out of state for one out uh, where I'm a guest, if that makes sense, like an author panel person. So I feel like you've traveled for yours. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, like, I, so I live in South Carolina. There's only small ones here. Uh, so typically I have to go to like Charlotte, Atlanta, those kinds of cities, like cities, basically, to actually go to one that's pretty big. I was kind of bummed out. I didn't go to Jordan Con, and that's one of the bigger ones in the South that I just have never been to. Well, maybe next year. Next year, we'll both I, make a point of doing it. <laughs> I told my family. So, for whatever reason, like eighty-five percent of my family is born between March and April, and we all just kind of like get together and have like a big weekend, and it's always on Jordan Con weekend. I feel like, or it hasn't <laughs> really been that way. So this year, I was fair, like, you fair. got. Got me this year, not next year. I got you. And I had someone ask, where in South Carolina, if if you were okay with saying uh, that? Because some people don't. Some people don't want to know. But what was it? I'm in Charleston. It's a big enough city. I feel safe saying that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Please don't stop me. Right? <laughs> I love Charleston, though. We actually had a, a local con a couple of weeks ago called Atomicon. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had Grady Hendrix there, which was awesome. Like, uh, he's pretty big in the horror book, like, genre. Um, writes mm -hmm. things like My Best Friend's Exorcism. And, uh, yeah, it, it was really cool to meet an author that's big that's from the same city. Uh, so. That is really cool. And uh, Charleston's lovely. I, I do like Charleston. But, yeah, it's something that uh, I didn't even think about it. But. Yeah, I haven't heard a lot of bookish events coming through that city, or else I would probably sign up too, <laughs> because yeah. it is such a lovely city, and it's not that far away from me. Close enough. <laughs> I figure it'd be great. They have like a literary, um, I, I, the name is eluding me right now. It's usually in November, but it's like a literary festival um, that I think is kind of the other big event aside from Comic-Con in Charleston. Otherwise, it's just like your little Comic-Con you know, come out this Saturday for a few hours to, to meet people and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Those types of events. Hey, every event matters. And like, especially if you're a person who's comfortable at selling your works there, because you never know. A uh, couple sales here or there, you may meet a super fan, which can help you down the line tremendously. And we love our super fans. And I just saw a little comment popping up saying you got uh, Libra got my latest book in the Jet Chronicles. It technically doesn't release till tomorrow. So don't tell anybody. <laughs> That's what I'm <laughs> Yes, as an indie author, my books go live before I release them, if that makes sense. So you you figured it out. <laughs> that actually yeah. happened to me with one of my books on Amazon. So I don't know if that's like, I hope that's not something that happens a lot, but I'm guessing it is. Well, for it's hard for, like, I can only speak as the indie author. You can say, okay, I want my book to go and, like, go through the approval process. And it can take, as I say, up to... 70 uh 72 hours and i want to make sure they're all up make sure there's no glitches and anything so i always let them go live on the dl a few days before so i can kind of link them and all the links onto my website and just again make sure they all look pretty and there is no red flags and uh but yeah so I, a few people have figured that out where they're like we'll pay attention or they just stumble upon it i'm like you probably got the first one <laughs> Talk about sneak peek. So but, uh, yeah. is, I know that you have like multiple series out. Like I know the Guardian Speaker is kind of the, the one that has the most books. I don't think that I've really seen much about this one, but I think is this like the third or fourth book in? This is, yeah, the, the fourth. I, it's interesting because different platforms focus on different book series for whatever reason. And so on Book Talk, uh, the Guardian Speaker, my Dark Viking fantasy series, um, is seems to be the most popular on this platform. And uh, I think it's just because I cater to a bunch of readers who are, you know, adult and they like the grittier fantasy and, uh, you know, Norse retelling is pretty popular right now. Yeah. Plus there are novellas who they're quicker to release. So I have three slotted to release towards the end of this year and then the series will be done. <laughs> 
I'll be over. But, uh, but yeah, so the, the one that I'm doing my other series that I'm releasing simultaneously is on the other side of the spectrum for fantasy. It's young adult. It's on the more noble bright side, the quest, the adventure, just a fun fantasy. It's wild. It's out there, but it's just, it's supposed to be fun and, you know, and it's supposed to be approachable for the younger side of YA and hopefully all the way to adults because I do have a few adult readers that really like it, but it is, it's probably the most out there in storyline. But for you, you, you do the horror, you do the grim dark. I think you mentioned, I don't know if I'm supposed to say anything behind the scenes that you may be dabbling and coming to the indie publishing side of things soon. Who knows? <laughs> Yeah, well, so it, it's something that both I want to just learn about, and also it's something that uh, I would like to just see how it goes with like my first like actual horror book release. Uh, Ooh, fun. The Gifthorn Chronicles is kind of a mix. It's most I call it dark fantasy, but it is grim dark. Um, has a lot of horror elements in it, but I wouldn't call it you know strictly like a horror book. That's not where you'd find it in a store or anything. You'd find it in the, you know, the fantasy section. Um, but no, this this uh, new book that I'm writing is all horror. And I think it'd be a good idea to just kind of like see how it goes because it's not big. It's a novella. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> and I think indie publishing is great for people who want to release novellas because of mainstream. It's hard to get publishing agents, especially the publishing houses, on board with something so small. And if people are doing, you know, a one-off or a series, it's just a hard sell right now. But they are becoming more popular, the concept of novellas and these quicker little bite-sized booklets. And, uh, but yeah, I, I've, I've had success with lot. my Guardian Speaker, so hopefully you do with your new upcoming horror. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I, there's something fascinating about it to me. I've just been reading a lot of horror books that are under 200 pages. And I was like, I could probably do this. And I'm curious to see how it'd go. And that way I could also control the timeline of when it releases. Because mm -hmm. now with like the current, like the fantasy series that I'm writing, I'm writing the last one now, but it's usually only one book gets published a year uh, is or, or every nine months or so. So it's not like a... Uh, Oh, I finished it. I can do some quick edits, have someone look it over and edit it a little bit, and then maybe see how it does. Um, and that's the thing. There are pros and cons to everything. And so for people who go through the publishing houses, and if anybody's listening and doesn't know, it's not a quick turnaround. <laughs> it takes, it's a long, pro it's a long game, long process. And there are a lot of perks doing it that way, but uh, getting things out quick or in mass is not one of them. <laughs> I agree. I agree. <laughs> and if you are a quick writer and you have all these other books waiting, it's kind of like, well, now what? <laughs> yeah. Well, so for the first time in my life, I've actually, comp I have a little notebook. I've just compiled stories and some of them, I actually have many pages written about it. Mm -hmm. Others, it's just like a paragraph, but it, it kind of has gotten to that level where it's like, I'm coming up with all of these really great ideas. But because I'm still focused on my main series, I kind of struggle to divide up my time into these different stories. And I guess for you, someone that has published and kind of you're going through multiple series at a time, what, do you have any advice on uh, how you do that? Do you write like one book at a time or can you bounce from like the YA to the dark? I, how I do it, I structure, well, I am, knock on wood that this continues on going this way. I don't know. Right now it's been a slow month, but I am full-time author and artist. So if I'm not painting pets and animals, I'm writing books. And I do have that benefit. Now, not everybody has that uh, benefit of that luxury of that mass time. But because of that, I spend mornings, if at all possible, writing new material. So whatever book of whichever series is my current one that I'm new material book, I write through that from the beginning to end. I don't break that apart. And then in the afternoon, it just depends on my publishing cycle, which book of what series I'm focusing on. It could be editing, it could be marketing, it could be formatting, et cetera, so on. So in the afternoons, it can switch up. And uh, it's been a little crazy recently because I've been getting audiobook files and again, I'm about to release this book and writing another. And I'm like, what book? Where are we in the storyline? Because I'm doing three different you know, of the same series, but like all different timelines because I'm jumping back and forth. And I'm like, wait, who knows what, where are we? <laughs> so it can get a little, 
it can get a little complicated sometimes, but for the most part, yeah, I, when I'm writing a new book, I'm focusing on writing just one new book. And then the rest of my time, that's where it just depends on what is needed. So yeah. deadlines, yeah. deadlines help. <laughs> I, I have been seeing that a lot more in my comments, like people asking about audio, which I don't actually offer yet. I think my thought process was I would like to get the full series out before mm -hmm. committing to audio and just see how well it does. But I'm seeing it so much more now that I'm just like, I wonder if I, you know, uh, could maybe just put the first three out in audio and then put the last three out once the final three books are out. But uh, what is your opinion on that? Do you feel like audio is kind of a must? Um, I've noticed I, I held off for a long time because it can be expensive depending on how you do it. Now, if you're confident with narrating yourself or if you want to do um, one of the uh, split profits with a narrator and, you know, that's that's then no money out of your pocket. It's just that you're contracted with the other person for X amount of years and just be aware of that pros and cons with everything. But uh, but for the full, what a lot of people do is, you know, pay and narrator outright kind of thing. It is, it's a budgeting thing. And so I hold off, hold off. But when I finally dove into it, there is a huge potential return on the investment side, because if you're, I mean, um, even if you go through an exclusive thing, like I started with uh, Audible, but the amount of money you can still make off of that is far more than selling eBooks <laughs> because they just cost more. And so your percentage is just a little bit more. And now as of here's my, here's my sneak, my seat, my other secret that's, uh, we'll be releasing soon. I'm starting to move some of my audiobook series onto my website's bookshop. So I'll be able to sell direct, which will also increase, uh, my cut by a lot. And so that will also help me be able to do stuff. But I found a lot of value in it. There are a lot of people who only listen to audiobooks. There are people who only listen to it because time and maybe some more people are dyslexic. Some people have sight impairment and uh, that just helps them. So you can reach a whole new group of readers if you choose to do that. It's just I'm starting to feel that a lot in my videos now where people are, that's, I would say the number one comment of the last six months. <laughs> is, mm -hmm. Yo, is this and it's, or? <laughs> it's it's a cool thing yeah. it is really cool to like hear your characters come alive so if you do invest into it you know uh you can it can be up to you if you want to decide if you want to try it with one see how it goes or do the whole thing um some of the other authors on this platform i've seen a couple of them run stuff like kickstarters just to raise funds for to pay and cover the cost of audiobooks and of course in their kickstarter they offer the print and the ebooks or whatever else they want to offer but but the perk is you're helping them create an audiobook so you're going to get that as well right no that's cool uh just curious i've been kind of putting my feelers out so uh yeah. and i know that you uh i can't i i remember that he was from vikings but you did get an awesome uh <laughs> yes. voice on actor i think for one of yours that's killer that's awesome yeah his uh george blagden he was apple stan from the first series of vikings now that netflix has its like subsequent one it gets a little convoluted but but yeah he was he's a fantastic narrator and so yeah he's doing my viking dark fantasy series and we've created five of them so far plus uh the first omnibus of collection so we have a few of those out but because he's also an actor I have to work around his schedule. <laughs> so yeah, it takes, it, it's not, uh, I'm not able to release him out, you know, consistently. That's the only downside with working with someone like him. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, good to know. I mean, you just don't think about that kind of stuff, I guess, but until you get into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, there's a lot, being an author, there's so much you have to think about outside of just writing. It's, it's a little amazing and uh, perplexing at times. You're like, I want to write and create wonderful books, but now I have to learn how to do this, 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 and this. And I'm sure even though you work through a uh, publishing house at the moment, you still have some of that mm -hmm. issues where you want to write, but you also have to do X, Y, and Z. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm still, I am still very much, I feel like a novice going into the marketing side. I've gotten a lot better. Uh, I've gotten a lot better at networking as well, mm -hmm. but those are two things that, 
uh, basically selling my first book series to a publishing company. I had no clue going into it. You know, I, I just have kind of been um, playing it as I go, I guess. And now I'm finally like three years later, starting to be able to plan and kind of understand the full scope of things a little bit better. It's definitely a lot to it. I wish it was just writing, but unfortunately, <laughs> If I were a millionaire, it might be, but it's not. So well, I like writing and I do like chatting with people who want to talk about books, especially, you know, oh, the I books are right. That's very flattering. And it's kind of fun to hear people and they're like, ooh, so your character, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> people are paying attention. A plus, gold star. Yay. <laughs> yep. Let's talk some more. No, I feel like those are like the ultimate compliments when people specifically say something specific from your series, one of your series, and it's just like, Wow. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so with actually, while we're talking about your series, since I have forgot to ask you though, earlier on, why don't you, before anybody who does not know you, introduce yourself and what you write? Because we just blew past that part. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, uh, so I am Drew Bailey. I <laughs> primarily write dark fantasy. I'm also starting to write some horror though. Uh, nothing has been published as far as the horror side. So that's down the road. But right now I, in writing a book series called The Giftborn Chronicles, this is what the first volume looks like. And it is uh, kind of what we've been describing. Uh, in my head, it's grim, dark, dark fantasy, but there are a lot of horror elements, especially as the series progresses, um, that I kind of like put in there. I love things like eldritch creatures. I love zombie survival type stuff. So all of that kind of gets mashed into the, the book series. It's very adult, uh, not YA at all. Some of the characters are like 20, 21, kind of in that range. And there are some main characters that are in their mid thirties and 40. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I like the mix of writing, uh, different age, you know, uh, generations, I guess. And just the, uh, the different mindset you kind of have to go into to write that. And that's primarily why I did it. I also started the book series when I was in my, my mid twenties and I've been writing it up and I'm 40 now. So it's like, I've been writing it for 15 years. And as it progressed, it's like, I wanted to write older characters, but yeah, I still I have these younger ones who more reflected me back, you know, back in the day. So, um, but this is the, I'm writing the sixth book now and it, has been a bit of a struggle because I know it's the last one I've kind of gotten, I'm about 80% done with it. So I'm kind of at the end. Um, but it, yeah, no, I'm, I'm kind of finding out now how difficult it is to meet my own expectations when ending a series. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a series ending. Well, I, I, you have to let me know how you handle it because I, I, my first time I finished a series, it, it kind of has a weird feels because you're so proud of doing it, but then you have to say goodbye to people, the surviving characters. Let me just say, you have to say goodbye to the surviving characters. Yeah. And uh, it, it can be a little emotional, but it, it's, and I'm about to have to do that again with this other series. So I'm, I'm gearing myself up. I'm trying to like emotionally prepare myself to be like, and it's done. <laughs> I, so I try to, I've, I've pitched it to myself as this is what I would call like the core kind of main series that takes mm -hmm. place in this gift form world so that there is a chance of a spinoff or a different, you know, series or something yeah. that I can explore down the road. And uh, I, I kind of look at it that way. But I also think that how much time I've put into writing some of the other story, like the, the novella stories that I've been writing kind of it feels right it feels like the time's right now like i'm ready to kind of let it go for a little while and maybe five years from now i might get the inspiration to write about you know one of the main povs that survived this thing and see where that story takes me um but yeah i, I feel like there's a combination of that with i just kind of want to write something else you know <laughs> That's true. And I see a comment popping up more about planting a seed that will grow a galaxy these days. But that's true. I mean, a lot of people like doing that where you spend, like you said, you spend years, years and years for some people working on series, building your characters, developing, you know, the, the whole world building, universe building, multiverse, whatever you're doing. And 
when you have to say goodbye, it's hard, but if you leave those kind of little crack doors open, it does allow you to expand and your fan base, you know, once they're fans, they want to like live in that world as long as possible. And so giving them that hope of an opportunity, if, if not even that full opportunity to go back there, that's pretty cool. I mean, my first series, I have two prequel stories. If I ever so chose to go back there, I could write because I already know them. They're there in the back burner of my head, but kind of like what you were saying is with your novella, novella series, it just felt right to totally change over to the two book series I'm working on right now. And I already have three different projects lined up in the near future afterwards that are totally different as well, just because they fe it feels like it's right for those stories. So, yeah, it sounds like you might be kind of a mood writer, kind of like I am where I, I will fight it until I can't do it anymore, where I'm writing something. And it's just like, even it, though it might be the main thing that I need to concentrate on, mm -hmm. if it's not working, it's not working. And I still want to write. So I pour mm -hmm. that into something else. Sorry, I have my sister binging in. I'll have to call her back. But, uh, mm -hmm. but yes, yeah, sorry, sorry about that. But yes, you were saying, um, yeah, about, uh, even if you have to like push through something, you're, yeah, I understand. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I feel like that's kind of the, that's like one of those where I don't mind putting a day into it, but if it's something where I feel stuck, that's when I go, okay, I definitely need to sit this for, sit this down for a week or something like that. But mm -hmm. And my, my thing is the, I'm working, I'm building up to the more climatic books of my YA series. And there's so many things I want to tie together that all of a sudden I paused and I was like, how the heck am I <laughs> going to do this and make sense? I don't know if I have to split the books. I don't know what I'm doing. So I've kind of been like forcing it a little bit and I may just have to scratch it and rewrite it again in a little bit because if I don't want it to feel forced, but I'm just trying to get that ball rolling because I'm like, it has to happen. All the stuff. I just don't know the exact route and I keep kind of ping ball <laughs> back and forth trying to feel I've it. Kind of been doing that with, uh, there are five POV characters and usually I'm able to kind of make a crossroads, you know, with multiple characters. Cause I think it's fun to kind of play around with different like buddy duo, you know, dynamics. Yeah. So I like to do that, but I I've definitely felt like this has been the hardest book to write from that mm -hmm. perspective. Uh, it very much feels like I designed it for like linear type uh stories so it's been kind of fun i guess but also a pain kind of trying to make it feel interesting to me uh you know um i'm i'm actually very much interested to see what my editor does with it when they get a hold of it because <laughs> they've been nice to me on the last two books like the first three i had a lot of work to do but i think i kind of did i guess that author level up between books two and three mm, yeah. uh where and I've had people just straight up tell me, like, you just got better. You know, I don't know what to tell you. You, This reads better. It's a, I'm like, okay, I'll take your word for it. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I kind of feel like this this one here, I'm curious to see if they tear it apart, if they go, no, you actually did pretty good. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, I, <laughs> I sympathize with that one completely. But I do like the concept of author level up because that is a thing. And Authors, I feel, this is my point of view, that we should all challenge ourselves to level up with each subsequent work you do. And uh, I know right now, when I go back to my first series, love the series, I have fans that absolutely love the series and you know they'll talk about it all day, that's great. But compared to my writing now, it's very, very different. Yeah. And I'll have people who I've worked with since like day one, they're like, your writing now is so so much better than it was and not to say it was bad it was just you level up <laughs> no i could feel it like i felt it during the third book and that was like that was covid that was the year covid hit so i was in a kind of a rough rougher place where i think i was pouring a lot of that into the art uh to just get out a lot of feelings and honestly it didn't hurt to have people that knew what they were doing from like the editing side show me how to create a cleaner product you know mm -hmm. when i'm sending it to them so i think the combination of both of those things were what happened but yeah i've had a couple of conversations with other authors here like the last like year or so about like that level up and like when you felt like you leveled up versus when other people felt like you did uh and it's always a fun it's funny it, they're always fun conversations 
Yeah. Oh, I, I get that. And also I, I think part of it is if I love that concept of when it's right, the story just, you know, when you know a story's right and it's the right time to get to this, you know, story series plot line, it just works because when I came up with the Guardian Speaker, uh, that first novella I wrote in 24 or 48 hours, I just sat down and banged it out and it just felt so good. And the others are a little slower, they, you know, as I was building out, but, <laughs> but it felt right. It was the right time to get into that series and the right time to start working it. It was a breath of fresh air because you didn't, you can't get bogged down with a long-term project a little bit. And, uh, if, if you aren't as passionate about your work for whatever reason, maybe it's your 16th book of a series. Maybe it's because you're dealing with some kind of issue, trying to connect all the dots, whatever it is, um, that can slow, slow down your creative process, <laughs> at least for me. Definitely. No, I, I have this thing where I've, uh, I kind of like cap out at around like 12 to 15,000 words a month. So, I'm always interested when people are like, bam, I just wrote these, you know, like 60,000 words in a month. Like that would be nuts for me. I like the respect goes out for the people that, that I've never had an inspiration like that where it just hit and I could just write. So I, I, it, it's always, it, it just, what's that? I said few and far between for me, but it does feel good when you get that moment. Now, hopefully you'll feel that moment uh in the near future since you said you haven't done that yet that does happen uh i i have written a novella before and i wrote it in two months and it ended up being all right it was like thirty-two thousand words something like that mm -hmm. so i think that's the closest i've come it was it was a little under two months but that's the first time i felt like oh i just finished an entire story you know and like what i what felt like to me a small amount of time but... mm -hmm. hey and and uh don't don't knock authors who take years and years to do stuff. Sometimes they're just they know their craft and they know exact that's exactly what it takes and that their book. I, needs I feel it. like I am still. Um, I introduced my sister in law to um, Patrick Rothfuss, and I feel like I have to apologize to her at least two or three <laughs> times a year. I would say because he hasn't finished the third book in that series, so she blames me for that. Well, okay, I have to admit I do want to read that series, but because i know it's uh yeah. open-ended and there are all these other options i have i keep looking at other options <laughs> i i would One say day. this um i do recommend reading the first book but you could probably hold off on the second just as like to experience how how rothfuss's prose are so if you were looking okay. for just like this beautiful sweeping like fantasy it it's worth reading but yeah like i would I don't know. I, I would say the same thing about Game of Thrones. It's like, well, you might, you maybe want to read a book just to see if you like it, but it's not done yet. So uh, maybe yeah. don't. Uh. Will it be done? Eh, we don't know. I do see the comment that popped up a little bit. It's saying my editors are always angry at me. I don't know if I've ever had editors angry at my work, but I've had some times where we butted heads on the way the work should be written. <laughs> I. I'm, I feel like I'm very, I, so first off, I'll say this. I think Falstaff, the editors that I've worked with, they've done a really good job of giving me editors that like the genre that I'm writing. And I think that that's helpful, A. But second off, I think that I, I almost view it like I'm taking a class and I wrote a paper and they're giving me all the answers. So it's like when I turn it in and I see like, they they, they don't really change it, but they make me question things about why I did it this way. Mm -hmm. And it, it has like made multiple books, I would say considerably better because it made me rewrite entire sections, kind of made me think on a more logical level, uh, I guess of how it would work out. So. I've never dealt with my editors being angry, um, but I definitely have uh, had had books, you know, kind of uh, torn apart on the first draft where I had to make a lot of, uh, not a lot of changes, but had to make some modifications that I would not have seen otherwise. So I try not to look at it from, I guess, a bad standpoint if there's a lot of red there. Again, if a good editor, which hopefully you have a good editor, the point of what they do is to be on brutally honest and being like, if you want your book to 
become better, this is, you know, a, a good path to take. Now, are they always right? No, they're human. Um, do you have to always take their advice? No, you don't. But that's what they're there for. That's what you're paying them there for. So, you know, grammatical errors and spelling aside, if they, you know, tear apart your story, they're not trying to be mean. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> trying to prove your Every editor I've ever spoken with and talked to, you know, they, they have their opinions, but I always have thought that they are trying to make your work better. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I do feel like if, if it feels like the editor's trying to take over your work, then run away. <laughs> At that point, say <laughs> yes. something. But every, uh, my experience, I've just been lucky, probably. Like, I've had three different editors, uh, like, for development editors, at least. Mm -hmm. And, it, yeah, I just thought it was, they did a tremendous job. And I actually looked forward to the edit. Like, I looked forward to getting uh, the the first draft back so that I could kind of compare the two side by side. And it was kind of fun to map out you know, differences and make it better. Um, mm -hmm. So I've been pretty lucky. That is that is really neat. I love that. Absolutely love it. Now, actually, let me ask you, um, I can't remember, if we've, we've talked on one of these before, it's been a moment, but for you and your work, because you do go through your publishing house, you do have uh, a different way of approaching publishing than I do. Do you sell signed copies? I'm asking one because you uh, you never know with readerships. Like, do you ever do anything like that, or is it more anything set up? Like, you can't go to my website right now and just buy a signed copy. Uh, that is something that I'm probably going to start doing at some point. But no, like when I go to an event right now and how it's been, I when I go to an event, first of all, I stop by the Falstaff table. And however many copies of their books I they have, like I sign those and each book kind of has like a little saying that I have with my signature. And I just, you know, however many they have, be it two or 10 or mm -hmm. whatever, I just make sure all of that's done. Any copy that gets bought directly from me, yeah, I uh, basically have like, you know, specific things that I'll say, or if it's a gift for somebody, like I had a lot of people ordering around Christmas um, and, you know, I had specific things that they wanted you know that kind of thing so where can people order from you do you have a because some a lot of people now have book talk shops and stuff like that like where can people get i'm, I'm just asking for for maybe myself because i do like sign copies of books so <laughs> so well so i'll be a dragon con you don't have to worry about it <laughs> i will have copies there um and absolutely vice versa uh, i'm interested in reading the the guardian speaker series for sure so perfect um but Right now, you can go to my website, and I just have links to, uh, like, Amazon. Also, on the Falstaff books, they have an online store. You can you can order them from there as well. You'll have, you know, trade back, which is, you know, kind of like a little bit bigger than a normal paperback, and then hardback, and then ebooks as well. That's cool. cool. Perfect. I, I, so I don't actually, I think it's 5,000 followers. Uh, I'm not quite there yet uh, for the TikTok shop. So I don't actually know what that's like, but I've heard very mixed reviews from people as to whether or not it's worth exploring. For me, I I have a TikTok shop, but I also synced it with my website personally because one, they're not a lot there are people who will prefer not to buy through um, this platform. And so having that option and, you know, having everything synced. So if someone buys from one or the other, you know, all the numbers still add up <laughs> and I'm not overselling stuff. That's always nice. So I have that option. I'm like, either way, uh, the nice thing of people buying through the TikTok shop is that TikTok can uh, help you with the shipping of stuff. They'll cover like they'll they'll calculate the shipping for you. They'll have the te uh, the printed out. Um, you just print it from home. Um, shipping label ready so you can slap it on drop off the books in their boxes and walk you know you're done and so that's nice um versus me having to provide you know all that kind of stuff and making sure everything is uh written right correctly and you know pay for it and get into the usps and just stand in line all that fun stuff yeah. so there are pros <laughs> pros and cons for everything um uh, i like having it as an option but i sold almost all my stuff through my website shop, even if I'm posting videos about the TikTok shop, people just go straight to my website and be like, we're gonna buy from you. I'm like, they're both from me, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> I think that 
and I do like being at a like a super small publish you know publishing house I still feel very I'm considered part of that like indie group you know kind mm -hmm. of that uh non-traditional not one of the top five you know the big yeah. five yeah. uh big four whatever um and I, I think because of that people are more inclined to want to support specifically you because I do get a lot of like direct you know dms mm -hmm. asking hey uh how do I get you more money? <laughs> yes, and that's the something. nice. But I, nice. I don't want to pay Amazon. I want to pay you. And mm -hmm. you know, that, at that point, that's where I kind of let them know, well, I can ship it to you, but you might be paying a little bit more for shipping. Yes, and that that is true. Yeah. But I think, again, at least from my experience, a lot of people are willing to pay that little extra and, again, support a small business that's that's growing and have that link and have that kind of tactile being like, it was for me to you and there was nothing else in between. And I know for, for my printed stuff, I do charge a little bit more. Shipping's part of it, packaging's part of it. But I also, because of that, add in little gifts to them because I'm like, hey, you supported me, you're willing to do this. And I know I, I don't have free shipping, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. But because you're willing to do this, I'll give you a couple of these like bonus goodies every time just because it's, it's a, it's very nice for people who want to support you at whatever level. So that is kind of neat. Absolutely. And I mean, as a reader, uh, you know, especially, like I said, I've been kind of getting into like popular, like indie horror authors here lately. I've been pulling so many ideas from like the goodies that they include. Cause mm -hmm. I, I like to do what people, you know, have done for you where they go directly to your website and mm -hmm. you can order kind of like the, the rando goodie basket with these couple of books or whatever. I think that's cool. Like, it's just kind of a fun uh, aspect of it where it's like, I don't really know what I'm getting, but I hope it's neat, you know? <laughs> that is fun. That is fun. And it's, it is cool to come up with um, just all different ideas. I love, I love doing these chats because uh, talking with so many authors, everybody has like great, their own great, like little idea that they've come up with and they're so willing to share. And so I've definitely learned some things and definitely for me, I have other things. I'm like, hmm, maybe I should consider this or I've never thought about that. Like, for instance, I was talking with another author on here and um, she does these virtual book boxes because not everybody's able to afford a physical book box. So you get like an ebook, but along with it, you get um, print printable content, you know, uh, character art in a digital form and anything that's digital audio sounds and um, playlists and stuff like that. And it's all just sent through emails. So you get a book box, but it's virtual. And I was just like, that is brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I haven't actually seen anything like that before. That's really cool. Because I, I, I've thought about doing like digital character art. And, you know, I've kind of played around with just some random AI things just to see what it was like. But I'd rather pay like an artist to actually mm -hmm. do the art. And then, yeah, to be able to include it like that. Uh, that's an idea I did not have. So that's awesome. Thanks for that share. See, I love, I love when people can, it's not my idea. So do not take it. That is uh, Nicole York, like uh, it's all her, but uh, it's something that I'm, I'm considering potentially when I have the time to figure out how to do it and what to put in, I might start doing stuff like that. But it's that time thing. <laughs> the most scarce resource in the world, time. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so, with your your upcoming horror novella when do you see yourself trying to dabble with publishing do you have like a, a goal in mind of okay i'm doing it next year or over the holidays or when do you think you're going to try to release so my i do have i've finished what would be a spin-off novella that takes place in the world of the giftborn chronicles it's something that i wrote last summer um it definitely needs to be edited i've I combed back through it earlier this year after letting it sit for, I don't know, four or five months. And I liked it, uh, but it will be something that I will probably be bugging my editor friends, uh, seeing which one, you know, might prefer to do it because even though it takes place in this like medieval fantasy world, this story is very much horror. So it's not gonna, it's, it's more extreme horror, I would say than like dark fantasy. Um, but I've kind of, I wrote it to be a bridge to another series at some point down the road. Mm -hmm. So my thought is to maybe try and see how well that one does uh, once I get the art for the cover. Um, 
And so that might be the first one I do. But as for the actual like horror book itself, I think timeline would be middle of the year next year, just because nice. I haven't even finished the first draft. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's realistic, like this time next year. Uh, mm -hmm. But I would like to see the potential of, you know, how self publishing with a novella works with this little uh, kind of spinoff book that I've done. But that is so cool. Story, I guess, more than a book. Because I don't know that I will actually do like hard copies of that out the gate. I think I might just offer it as digital. And mm -hmm. that's kind of what I've done with my. And then see how it goes. Uh, and the way that I've done it, uh, it would be something where it's beneficial to have read at least the first two books in the series because mm -hmm. you'll get like little Easter egg things in this story. But for the novella, you will not have had to have read that for it to really to make sense. It's still like its own complete thing. Well, here, here I, again, these great ideas from other authors, I get not mine. And this one was from um, uh, D, uh, uh, Zia Diamante. He what he did for his is he came up and wrote a bunch of these little short stories for about their char his characters for his main series. And he compiled them in a novella. But what he did was in the novella, He's, he would say, if you want to read it in actual chronological order, you would read this particular short, uh, chapter five, and this particular short, and that. And so, if someone really wanted to just read in order of like the timeline, they could do that, or they could read them separate. And it didn't, you know, hurt that much. You just learned about the characters maybe a little earlier, a little later than you would if you were reading the book. But it was just like so. If you have the novella saying, "Hey, idealistically." If you want to sink it in, sink it in between books one and two or wherever you want to do, and then, but you don't have to. No, that's cool. Like, I, it, so it sounds like he did like a day in the life type, like uh, just kind of like a flashback story to kind of get you. They, they were little side stories. They were just, you know, uh, ways to kind of get to know the character, but it didn't play into the main plot. They were just maybe a mini adventure or a cute little quirky story with the character and his interaction um, with the world around him. And uh, it, for a reader, you kind of got a taste of the character without needing to, because those stories were kind of little separate bubbles from the storyline of the main book series. Gotcha. Okay. No, that, I mean, that's, that's, I, I think that I could do that. I was think while you were telling me everything, I was like, do I have enough like thrown away chapters that I could, you know, <laughs> do something? I don't know that I do though. Hey, that would be kind of fun. Like a little, your own, I don't know what you would call it. Cause it's not really a novella, but you come up with a term for it. But like, yeah, the, yeah, the cut like, chapters. But it's like a character anthology. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Then you could do character anthology. I was gonna say, but in general, wouldn't that be cool? Because some, some authors do have to cut and edit dramatically their storyline before publishing. So what if you came out with like a collection of pre-edited or pre-cut chapters or sections and just compile them and say, hey, this is where they fit in in the main story. If you were that super fan, you can get this like little bundle. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, I, yeah, I, you, you know, <laughs> it's something people love stories enough that I think that that is, it, you never know. You never know what would be like a popular thing that people would love. And that definitely could be it. And I know right now, one of the growing things in the indie side of things is the platform Ream. If you've heard of it. I don't know that I have actually. So Ream is kind of like Patreon, but it was created by readers and authors for readers and authors. So it's Patreon, you can set it up at various levels. And the concept, I guess at the core is when you're writing a story, you put it, you plug in like your unedited first draft chapters in there and people pay to get like the early cuts oh, of them okay. and give you some stuff. And then obviously you can make it as fancy as you want, like any other kind of Patreon style thing. If you want to be like, oh, character art or whatever at this level and whatever. But uh, it allows authors to get some funding early on while they're creating the stories and uh, you can converse with your people there and becomes like its own little platform. So, you know, if you need to, it helps you with your editing. And I've heard a lot of good things from authors who are jumping over to that platform. It's another one of my list of, I should try this soon when I have the time. <laughs> 
So wait, it's called Ream or? R yeah, Ream, R-E-A-M. Okay, yeah, I have to look into that. I, nope, that one's just eluded me. <laughs> hey, like I said, it's on the it's on the indie side of publishing, I think. Um, but uh, if you're interested in looking at options, that is now another type of option for early release. And then you publish your book and uh, the readers who kind of essentially helped you along, a lot of them will still go by the, the finalized manuscript because they want to know what's changed. <laughs> well, so that, that's another thing that I really love and that I'm seeing more of with like indie, you know, indie book selling, whether you're doing it like self pub or not, like is, is just like how involved people want to be, you know, mm -hmm. and, and there's so many, I think you're not in a box. I feel like with traditional, sometimes it feels like you're in a box. And so you kind of have, you're more open to do things like what you're describing here with this. And I think that that has intrigued me as well. Like little things like that, that I'm like, well, you know, I may not be more successful, but it would be cool to just kind of know this side of the industry, you know, mm -hmm. that's kind of where Yeah, because. Publishing is changing, traditional or not, like it's all changing. And, you know, just to be aware of how things are evolving in different little sub pockets is kind of, you know, probably good to know <laughs> for strategy for yourself. But, uh, but yeah, it doesn't mean you have to do it, but it is kind of neat to see the evolution of how things are expanding in various ways that I would never have thought when people were like, oh, I publish a book. Never would have thought some of these things. Like, I, well, so I feel like I first got on TikTok and it was like 2020, like around when COVID hit. I didn't really think about it. I used it, I think, for what the platform was. Like, I wasn't on Book Talk. I didn't really bother, you know, with, I didn't really see a lot of that. Um, I just saw like cats, you know, falling and stuff. Like, that, that was it. <laughs> and I gave it up for like six, seven months. And it was like uh, later that year, I came back and that's when I started finding all of these Book Talk like all of these book community type things. And I, I had no idea that that's where it even was at that point in time. And just to see how it's grown over the last like three years, mm -hmm. it's been pretty wild. It is. And things are constantly changing. I never feel like I'm caught up, but <laughs> it's okay. Always challenge yourself to learn, continue right. to learn, continue to try things. And uh, you never know where it'll take you. But, uh, but let me ask you, because the hour's rounding out, and I know we talked about some of the stuff about like, you have a website. Uh, I'm saying, I'm reiterating this because if I'm able to repurpose this on my YouTube channel, um, I will, <laughs> I will. And I wanna make sure to put all your goodies down below, but where else can people find and follow you outside of your website? Because I know there you link to Amazon and you know, your I've, other I've been kind of somewhat active on, on TikTok. I would say that I'm, going to start being a little bit more active. I just kind of needed to take a little bit of a social media break. That's okay. um, and, you know, like I've started to kind of get back into the swing of things uh, like the last month or so. Mm -hmm. um, I do have, yeah, so TikTok, I do have uh, Insta, which I'm also gonna be a little bit more active on there. And that's pretty much, that is it. I do have things like threads and that kind of thing that I, don't want to say or i mean it's woefully abandoned i feel bad for my threads i, <laughs> I need to do more but i i feel like it would just become like random thought of the day and mm -hmm. I, I don't really have like a strategy with threads like that's part of the reason why i was never really on twitter it's just yeah I don't, I don't really know whereas i do think that some of the trends that happen sometimes randomly on TikTok are fun and uh i just have more friends i guess i've met more people on here and have you know messaged with people on here more so this is typically the one that i am going to be on if i'm going to do anything hey i i i like that i'm like for me yes this is the one that i enjoy <laughs> hanging out with the most it's also the easiest one in the way my my own brain works to engage like you said with people to meet people to connect to and the readers and authors and writers and just the advice and information and suggestions and the now woefully huh, woefully woefully large tbr list of books that i will eventually get to <laughs> i promise i will do my best but but yeah it is it's a fun platform and uh yeah there are some that i just never got into x twitter being one couldn't I, I have one. It's there. I, I don't really do much with it. I'll be honest. It's just there. <laughs> yeah, same. 
Same. I actually use it for like looking at like sports things. I think that's what my Twitter is now. And I've rarely been on there, but it's like when I am, I'm like, oh, let me uh, see what they have to say about this, you know, like from the Super Bowl or something. I don't know. <laughs> One of the fun things, like, again, each platform offers different opportunities to reach new people and engage in different ways. And just depending on how who you are and how you like to interact with the world can affect you different ways. Um, I... For me, I've started really enjoying building up my Facebook group as well as this platform because they're also a fun a fun group of people, a great resource. And one of the things I did, because I heard about this from another author at DragonCon last fall, is, you, is letting them kind of help invest in the book creativity process. And so looking forward at new series that I gonna slowly use, you know, work on the world building part and I already have the concept. It's like The Witcher meets D and D, dark fantasy, because I love dark fantasy, of course. <laughs> and I let them create a monster for my upcoming series. And so I kind of took them through the process. I was like, okay, we had to think of the environment, their personality. You know, are they single? Do they hunt? You know, solitary? Do they do pods or groups or units and all that stuff? And work through a whole process, kind of also teaching them, you know, how to creatively come up with things. And they voted and created this, this uh, terrifying creature. And as a bonus thank you, I wrote a short story featuring their cre creature. So I gifted it to them, but now I have a creature to embed in my future book series, which was a lot of fun. So that was just a fun little engagement thing. I feel like that's the, I feel like that's the creature equivalent to readers that want you to kill them in their books. Yes. I have had that happen so weird. I've never actually wrote that person into the book, but I have had that request. Yep. <laughs> it is fun. I have a question for you that popped up actually. You're saying, hey Drew, how long have you been writing for and sharing on this platform? I So I've been writing since like 2007, 2008, um, but not, I would say full time um, until like full time, I would say like 2016 or so was when I would mm -hmm. actually started to take writing seriously and decided, you know, started writing almost every day, if not every day. And it kind of became a lifestyle choice type of thing. Um, so I, I would I would say 2016 it, realistically. Um, and I, I have been sharing on TikTok like the last few years, I would say I do go through like time periods where I might not be posting as much or I might be kind of posting the same things. Uh, but, you know, it's, it, it's just usually when I'm busier in my day to day life and I just don't have the time. But hey, and the thing about reposting, I know certain people who are maybe a little more avid fans who actually go in and look for your stuff might get a little bored with certain redundancy, but the way algorithms work, I know a lot of people say, you know, if you post something similar a couple times, you have that potential of reaching someone else new who didn't see it the first time. So it's okay. It's and it takes okay. that stress off your shoulders. You don't want to ever have burnout. And so I, I'm trying to be better about repurposing and reposting with, uh, with a balance. I always want to make sure, again, readers who come and look at my page, they get something new. Usually it's the question of the day for sure, but like something new, something fun, a little fresh, but then also, again, try to constantly reach new readers, which some, sometimes it's hard. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, marketing I, I feel is like dark fantasy is kind of niche too. Like you, the people that love it, love it. Mm -hmm. And there's like no chance that you're going to be a miss for them. But like uh, the people that don't, they're just like dark. It's just a little too dark for me. There's nothing you can really do. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to, I definitely will never be the type of person that would glow up my book from a different aspect and try to hide another, you know, like I'll be honest every single time. Like th these are, you know, these are some trigger content type things that mm -hmm. you need to be aware of. Um, yeah and that and that's that's good i mean no book's going to be favored by everybody it's impossible everybody has such drastic tastes and so i i i like writing within kind of an epic second world fantasy style but 
between series, again, I can go light and bright a little more, you know, the YA side, I have the new adults, I have then the darker and gritty adult side. And I'm like, well, if you don't like one, you can try the other one, but like, I'm not going to change a series for yeah. someone. Yeah. But I can also try to point them into the right series. Though I had had someone, it was so funny, I had someone come out and reach out to me and pretty much straight up say, what I write isn't for them. But do I re can I recommend something in the genres that they like? And I was just like, huh. <laughs> yeah, no, I really I feel like, feel like that's could, like. But I was like, that was a weird request, though. <laughs> just throwing that out, that was a little odd. I like that is, oh, they respect my opinion as an author, <laughs> but they just don't <laughs> like what I've written. You know, like that's how I would take it. Oh, it's just like a little strange, but it was like it was just funny because he it was a person that was just like, I'm not going to read your stuff. Like never read it, but like just because I know I'm not going to like it but I want you to like help me, you know, find something I would like. I'm like, uh, <laughs> okay. I, so I, I think that I got lucky on that aspect because most of the people in my family were buying my book, obviously when it first came out and they were like, oh, we're never going to read this, but uh, <laughs> we're gonna, it's like, Thanks. you know, you don't even have to physically have the, just, I could take that back and sell it to someone <laughs> else who cares yeah. instead of it collecting dust. And it's, it's, it's sweet when someone wants to support you that way. But yeah, I'm, I'm totally agreeing. But I was like, I'd rather want my books to find the people who would read them. And yeah. you can, you know, be like thumbs up or whatever for me in my career. But if it's not for you, don't ever feel obligated to read my stuff, you know, <laughs> read it because you want to enjoy it. I, th I think that like I, I was very fortunate in most of my process that I, I didn't have to, you know, it's like I just kind of kept meeting people that I knew that they were the right person for it at that time. Like when I had people originally beta reading and that kind of thing, it's like mm -hmm. I knew I had the right people. Um, but yeah, no, I don't. I, there are plenty of books I know that are really good that I just don't like. So, so I just kind of look at it from that perspective. You know, if you yeah. know it's for you it's or if it's not for you, it's not for you. Yeah. There are definitely certain books that are super popular that aren't necessarily my cup of tea, but that's why everybody has what they like and they enjoy. Now, since we're rounding the end of the hour, this goes for anybody else who's listening as well as you, Drew. Is there any topic that you would like to cover that we didn't cover or any questions that you have that you didn't get a chance to ask? Is that not cool? mm, Now that I'm on the spot, no, I don't think I have anything. Uh... It's okay. <laughs> yeah, not really. <laughs> okay, wait, wait. I have one. For everybody who's jumped on a little later, because I know we talked about this really early, where is the next place that people can find and see you face to face? And what is your schedule for the rest of the year with events? Yeah, so the next event I will be at is going to be in Charlotte. It's Con Carolinas. Um, it is in a couple weeks, the weekend of, it's like May 31st through June 2nd. I'll be there. I'm going to be there as a guest. I'll be at the fall staff table uh, probably for maybe an hour or two each day. Um, so I'll be there signing books, talking with people, that kind of thing. Um, then after that, I don't think my next event is until Dragon Con, believe it or not. Uh, and then after that, there's another one in Atlanta. Um, like these are the ones I know for sure. Uh, there's one called Multiverse Con, and that's in Atlanta. It's October 18th. Oh, so we're both, okay, we're both going to be at that one. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a lot of fun last, like last year was pretty chill. I think it was their second year, um, but they had, it, it was just a really good vibe and I hope it blows up. Like, I hope it gets crazy. <laughs> okay, I'm excited because yeah, I, I did uh, sign up for that one and that is good to know. Now I'm going to know another familiar face there because, uh, but yeah, oh, so are you going to have a book booth or your uh, publishing house is going to have a book booth at a uh, multiverse con because that's something where I'm trying to decide if I should do that. <laughs> yeah, they definitely will. And it'll probably be one of those where if multiple people that usually run the booth are on panels, because I don't plan on being on panels on that one, but I got guested into one randomly last year. So you never yeah. know. Yeah, uh, but uh, that's kind of what I did last year was a few, you know, every once in a while I was kind of running the table while they were doing panels, but they've got a pretty big team. So they'll have, I think, maybe a booth or two. And then I know some of their authors, they just have their own tables. Uh, who, uh, Marshall was there last year and uh, like he yeah, had his. I know. He's going to be there and uh, another book talker. I think, uh, I think 
October Santorelli, who's another book talker here, um, is going to be there as well. So, yeah, Turtle Rocket. I feel like you know, hundred um, percent. You can only do what you can do. Uh, I mention my work to everybody. I, I feel like, <laughs> uh, but I I also. I've been called like an empath before, where it's just like, I just almost know whether or not it's worth doing. So I struggle with that because I feel like, why am I going to mention this? Um, mm -hmm. But if people are reading and they ask about me generally as an author, they just ask what I write, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, I, I feel like that's all you can really do. But for family, yeah, no, I, I didn't expect them to want to read my like, gothy you know fantasy because they don't really care about that if they're not going to watch game of thrones and wheel of yeah. time on tv they're definitely not going to you know pick up my six book series and start reading it so my expectations were low for them <laughs> hey i i just moved into a new neighborhood and some of the neighbors heard that i was an author and they immediately picked up uh a some of my YA book series, which is again, the, the weirdest series I have. And I, it's fun, it's out there. It's, but I was just like, of all the ones I would have recommended, it probably wouldn't have been that one because that is so extreme um, in the sci-fi fantasy stuff that I'm like, unless you were really into it, it's gonna be like, huh. <laughs> no, that's, I get it though, I do. I feel like there will come a day where I have two different series or two different things out that people, that'll be like, oh, you should have went with the other one for you. But that is funny, though. I, I do get that from, like, my real job, my nine to five. Like, I'm a tech writer. Mm -hmm. And there will be people that find out that I write fiction on the side. And they're like, do you think I would like it? And most of the time, my, my, uh, my meter is, do you mind a lot of language and some, you know, violence? Because <laughs> if you don't, then no, you're not going to like it. But it's always awkward to have that conversation with a coworker. <laughs> I guess, I guess, I don't know. I like talking about books, but so, uh, you know, I will, I will be also happy to say, hey, if this is not your thing, it may not be your thing, but I'm totally happy about talking about my books. For, yeah. I love my books. <laughs> I, I comp title it all the time. That's that's how I, when I, if I don't know, if I can't get a read on a person, I don't know them, but they're asking, mm -hmm. like, I just comp title. I'm like, did you like, uh, you know, The Blade Itself by Joe Abercrombie? Do you like the, you know, like that kind of thing, but. That's a smart way to approach. Yep. And uh, yeah, I see, I see you saying, uh, if I advertise on social media and my family find out, they either ask about it or they don't. And that's fair. You know, you don't have to shout that you're a writer if you, that's not what you want to say, uh, do. I do it just because I love my books. <laughs> Though I also very avidly will let you know, don't buy them unless you, you really like high right. fantasy, epic fantasy, you know, all this kind of stuff. Don't worry about it. There are other ways. Buy me a dinner. <laughs> there are other ways you can treat me. <laughs> Anywho, thank you so much for coming out and hanging out with me this past hour. I'm excited now that I I know for sure I'm going to see you now at two events this fall. My 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 only two events. <laughs> no, that's and cool. I'll probably pick your brain about other ones to apply in the future in the region because it would be fun to start kind of building out and traveling for a few and. Uh, Crossing figures that Charleston does something, you know, a little, I, or, or their little one. You said there was a little one. If that one gets a little bigger, that would be kind of cool too. Yeah. Well, I, I, so I'm not going to hold out too much hope on that. Like, I just feel like I, I, I'm not sure, but there's a lot of really good ones. Like if you're willing to go up to like Raleigh, like kind of in the North Carolina area, uh, there's congregate that's in July. It's like July 19th or something like that. I'm, or, or the 25th, I think something like that anyway it's a really good one as well um but like if you if you wanted to see like a good uh, lineup of events um i would say if you go to falstaff's website and they just have like an event area oh. you could just yeah straight up check up their events and they will give you a lot of the big writery type uh Ooh, smart Cons, yeah, and that's what I use kind of as my basis because it's a lot easier for me to go to ones that they're going to be at because yeah. they've already got a table and all I got to do is like kind of show up and help out if, if and if they don't need my help then I can just be a guest and have fun. But um, that's smart. yeah, that's that's kind of what I use, and they have most. They include from Tennessee, Kentucky, and they've got even some of the West Coast ones, but they include like you know South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina. Virginia, so that general like southern region, they've got a lot of of those. 
That's cool. And to answer your question that just popped up, uh, this is just a weekly chat with other bookish people. So yes, we, we do follow in the category of nerding out. Uh, typically, I mean, it could be any kind of books. I'm a fantasy author. He's fantasy author. Potentially soon will be a horror author as well. So we just talk about books and bookish things. And then thus gaming and TV and movies sometimes. It all depends. <laughs> But anywho, I need to go and release the dog outside. And uh, thank you again for hanging out. And if you ever want to do another one of these in the near future, let me know, especially when you release your book next year, but hopefully before then. <laughs> 100%. So time frame, maybe I'm hoping November, November, December-ish. We'll see. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> and I will definitely be seeing you a couple times later on the summer slash fall, whatever. <laughs> yep, definitely. It was great talking with you. It was great talking with you. And thank you for everybody who's chimed in and hung out. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>